This is Duke University. There are two things that really help solar uh, move forward. Um, one is the um, financing that's now available for solar, and the second is the regulatory political uh, environment. Um, on the first point, the, the, the companies that are being successful are the ones that have learned how to tap into capital markets. And what's happening over the past five years or so is the capital markets have become much more familiar with um, sol with solar and, and aware of the risks or the, the lack of risks that they come from uh, solar, solar technologies. And so that, that's been one driver. The other has been the, the regulatory policy support that uh, solar has. Uh, and that's on a state-by-state -state basis. I mean, each electric utility market is regulated at the state level. And so state policy and state regulation really drive that. And what you see are a number of states who have very thoughtful policies, North Carolina, I think, being a, a good example of that, that have really allowed solar to come into the marketplace and to become a competitor, to allow companies like Ecoplexus um, to compete in what has historically been a very closed regulated market. I think one of the biggest barriers that the solar industry faces is how um, regulators and utilities deal with the whole grid integration issue. Right now, we're doing it on a very simplistic manner, um, and the utility-scale solar that, that Ecoplexus is building um, basically operates in a, essentially a dumb mode. There is no dynamic control of it. The sun shines, we generate electricity, and we export it to, to the grid. Um, that brings with it some grid integration issues um, and can create some problems for the utility in the way they manage the grid in terms of voltage stability uh, and the like. The technology that we're using on solar farms in the inverters is quite capable of being contro dynamically controlled and addressing issues of power factor, for, for example, um, and can provide grid support, but we're not using those, those services. Um, and so I, I think we're going to have to see a change where we operate solar facilities in a much smarter mode, where we're using the dynamic controllability of, of inverters in a way that enhances the grid rather than just simply causes problems for the grid. That's going to require a completely different business relationship between the owner of the system and the operator of the grid. The, the price of conventional uh, electricity generation um, is a key driver to, to, to solar, particularly in the utility scale solar market that, that we operate in. Uh, and the reason for that is that the price that we're paid for the kilowatt hours that we generate is set at avoided cost. That's, that's utility speak for essentially their marginal cost. And of course, their marginal cost is determined by conventional uh, generation technologies. Today, that's natural gas. And so effectively, solar is competing with a natural gas turbine. Uh, and so when we go to the Utilities Commission uh, and establish the avoided cost that, that is the price we're going to get, um, we're debating the cost of a, of a turbine. What's the cost of fuel? What's the capital cost of building a turbine? Th those sorts of things. And so as those costs change, they have a big impact on the top line uh, for renewable generation. There are several innovations coming down the pike that I, I think are, are going to influence our electricity generation. Um, storage certainly is one of those, uh, though I think that's still probably a decade away. It, it's the, pr the trend of costs with storage are very, very encouraging, uh, and so it's certainly something to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, the other technology, which is already here, but hasn't really been fully deployed or really effectively deployed in a large scale, is demand management. Um, the, the issue of, of renewables entering the grid um, and, and becoming a significant part of our generation portfolio comes with or brings with it the, the fact that it's intermittent uh, and it's not nearly as controllable or dispatchable as, say, a gas turbine or a coal plant uh, is. Um, and so we have to have ways of keeping the grid stable, keeping the, the balance of supply and demand of, of electricity, um, keeping that balanced. Um, and that can be done with much broader deployment of demand management uh, technologies. And those are technologies that have been around for a long time. At the residential level, it's things like water heater uh, controls or uh, cycling of, of air conditioning systems and the like. Um, 
And what's happened is that the communication technologies, which used to be the big cost barrier to deploying those things at, on tens of thousands or millions of, of homes, have really come down. Um, and so when, you know, basically I think you'll see demand management becoming part of that whole internet of things trend that, that we've seen elsewhere um, as being the way. And, and it won't just be water heaters and, and air conditioners, it will be your dryer um, and how it operates. Um, sort of thing. So we'll see uh, energy using devices in the home communicating to um, an energy control system or an energy provider in, in a very different way. And so I think that technology uh, um, is something to keep an eye on.